are back. Okay, I will not go long form bio on the Doors um, because we're going to revisit them quite a few times. This is their third album, so I'll save a lot of the origin story and the stuff leading up to the first album for future Doors albums because I'll be covering them. But I do need to give a, a very basic skeleton right here. Doors were formed in uh, the Doors were formed in uh, LA in 1965. The members of the classic version of the Doors, uh, so that's after a couple early versions with multiple Manzarek brothers. Uh, it ends up becoming, uh, I think, the most well-known member of the band, vocalist Jim Morrison. The drummer is John Densmore. The keyboardist is Ray Manzarek. And the guitarist is Robbie Krieger. Uh, the band is formed when all the members of the band, ha- excuse me, all the members of the band have musical backgrounds besides Jim Morrison. Um, Krieger came to the band later, um, right before their first album. And Menzerek and Morrison were the first people to come together. They meet each other. And uh, there's a, as there will be many times with uh, Jim Morrison, there is a funny quote where Jim Morrison said at the time that he was taking notes at a fantastic rock and roll concert going on in my head. Is his thing about what happened when Manzarek <laughs> approached him. Don't worry, that won't be the last oh. Morrison quote in here. And that also won't be the last time that we explore Morrison's words because. Spoiler alert on this, the Doors are a fascinating band for me because there are parts of the band I love and parts of the band that represent like everything I dislike in music. So, and we're going to talk about that in this album, I think, quite a bit. So anyway, the Doors, uh, they end up gigging at two places. One is called the London Fog. Uh, They're the resident band there. Morrison starts off as sort of almost like an introverted, non-stage presence. He turns away from the crowd. Um, you know, kind of like what you see with like Daft Punk and stuff where they hide, you know, and just you don't see the lead singer. And then, you know, it's kind of like a mystery. He was kind of trying to do that vibe. Um, but then he starts to develop his repertoire and becomes sort of the swaggering. He's, you know, he's not the Lizard King till this album that we're going to cover today, but sort of that swaggering persona. Um, they then move to the Whiskey A Go-Go, which is a really well-known club that we'll be talking about all the way through the, the 80s and the 90s. Um, you know, bands playing there, but they're the house band. They get signed by Electra Records in 1966, and a couple weeks later, they get. <laughs> this is another great story. They get fired shortly afterwards from that. Um, one thing to mention too is they often were the opening band for the band Them. And trivia for you guys: Do you know who the most famous member of the band Them is? I do not know. I do not know. It is the unrelated to Jim Morrison, Van Morrison, who is the oh. most famous member of, Zamp- of them. So anyway, they, uh, they get fired from their gig at the Whiskey A Go-Go right before their first album um, because Jim Morrison decides to retell an explicit and profanity-laden version of Oedipus during a performance <laughs> of the song The End. So for those that know The End, mm-hmm. which we'll cover on their, their – um, their debut album much later and whoever's seen apocalypse now you'll know it from there as well but uh the end is already sort of a long and stem winding song and you can just imagine having that with jim morrison doing his own version of oedipus um because you know when you think about oedipus you think i need that to be sort of polished off by 60s beat poetry but you know hey to each their own but obviously the whiskey the whiskey a go-go agreed with me and said yeah not so much um during this time, they uh, right before this album, they have that infamous uh, Ed Sullivan performance where they're told to, mm-hmm. to change the uh, lyrics to "Light My Fire" uh, from "Girl, you, you couldn't get we couldn't get much higher," uh, and they don't. <laughs> and then, in in a quote that I have to give Jim Morrison credit, like a fantastic quote, they say they'll never play the show again. And Jim Morrison apparently on the way out swaggers and says, "Hey man, we just did the Sullivan show, so um, just a pretty awesome like <laughs> end line." And for those that don't know, The Doors, uh, here's the literary geek in me. The Doors uh, name is based on the Aldous Huxley book, The Doors of Perception, which is a really good read. If you've either never read that piece or Aldous Huxley in general. And that title is actually a reference to a quote by William Blake, who's a poet and short story writer who's also phenomenal. So uh, Morrison, even if I don't always love his stuff, definitely read good stuff um, because uh, both Huxley and Blake are awesome. And he is the one who came up with the name. So uh, we're almost about to talk about the album in a second. I won't go too much longer, but but this album's their third. Like I mentioned before, it was their first number one LP. Their first two albums were both released in 1967. 
uh, excuse me, 1966. Uh, this was released in 1967, and this actually happens. Uh, this is released probably uh, two months after an infamous uh, incident, the first of many incidents that Jim Morrison would have, uh, where he sort of upstages the band, where he um, he's in New Haven, Connecticut. He's making out with a fan backstage. The police officer is not aware of the fact that He's in the band. They tell him to get lost. Morrison tells him to eat it. Then he gets maced. He gets dragged off the <laughs> stage. And it kind of gets them, you know, their counterculture rep goes from, you know, well-known to, like, mainstream, right? That and the Sullivan Show sort of make the doors, like, the ultimate counterculture band at the time. So they release this album in April 1968. It's a very tense period of time for a number of different reasons. Uh, Jim Morrison is beginning to start his drinking uh, that he's not at like bearded Morrison or super erratic Morrison or fat Morrison at this point. He still looks like the classic Jim Morrison. He's just having sporadic incidents at this point, if that makes sense. Um, so that's becoming an issue with the band. The other thing is they originally intended for this album to uh, have what were the first uh, about seven songs of the album be the front side of it. And then the backside was going to be a 17-minute piece that, as you, might, as you might imagine, their producer, it was called The Celebration of the Lizard, and their uh, producer said, you know, I don't know if that's necessarily the best idea for a commercial album that we're trying to sell. And so they nix it, which really pisses off all the members of the band. Uh, you get to hear elements of Celebration of the Lizard, in Not to Touch the Earth, which represents a snippet of what would have been the 17 minutes. So when you listen to that song, you kind of get a feel for what Celebration of the Lizard may have sounded like. But that apparently was a real sticking point. And when you read about this album, it is the thing that is most mentioned in the thing that, you know, this album could have had the Celebration of the Lizard, but it wasn't there. Some people talk about it being such a tragedy. Some people say good decision. But this is kind of a polarizing Doors album. Um, you know, I think it's LA woman and the, the self-titled doors album are kind of universally recognized as pretty much all critics like them. Uh, Morrison hotel and strange days are kind of like in the middle, but usually pretty well regarded. Um, this one kind of falls in that, you know, you either think it's a great deep cut or you don't, I've got other info, but I don't want to kind of go there yet. Uh, what do you guys think? Uh, Josh, let's start with you. what do you think of this album? And, and I guess maybe a little bit about what your knowledge is of the doors heading into this. Yeah, the Doors are one of those bands, right, that almost that like de define the '60s in some way. I, I knew about them, you know, from early on in like middle school and stuff. Just Jim Morrison is one of those figures that becomes like a, you know, a figurehead for '60s counterculture, like you said, and wannabe hippies, you know, like the Doors first thing and things like that. And um, so I I knew of them and I know all of their hits and things, but I never listened to one of their albums before. And, um, really? So this is your first Doors album you've ever listened to? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Wow, I mean, I okay. know the singles, obviously, from movies and just hearing them on the radio and stuff. But um, yeah, so do that being said, the Doors have such a distinct sound, right? They have, like some of the other artists that we've listened to, when you hear a Doors song, I don't know. And I'll, yeah, so when you hear a Doors song, you know it's the Doors, or at least I do. And I do not like those songs. <laughs> I like the songs on this album that don't sound like Doors songs. Um, like like My Wild Love and and Five to One. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, is it like an organ that they have that is maybe that's what draws organ and a piano. Yeah, it's Ray Manzarek plays the, the, the I, whatever I think of the Doors, right? Manzarek is almost as much a part of it as um as Jim Morrison's voices, but he plays yeah. the organ, he plays the piano, he plays the harpsichord at times, but only yep. something like in, in that family of instruments. Yeah, I think it's the organ and the harpsichord that I associate with the doors, because when they're in those songs, it's just like hard for me not to, to um, like, like the not to touch the earth song. I don't like that song. So I can't imagine what a 17 minute version of you know, on the other side of the album would be like, um, so yeah, they never I'm... were able to finish it. So you'll never know. <laughs> yeah. So. so I get, I like, um, I get, I, I sound like a broken record, but I like parts of this album, but I didn't like all of it. Um, 
So maybe I'm with the populist on that. Gotcha. What do you think, Matt? So I knew the first, I think the first time I ever heard about the doors was when my parents went to go see the movie, the doors, the Oliver Stone movie. Um, oh, yeah. And I remember them coming back saying, talking about how sad it was, you know, how, you know, just the, 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 the story of Jim Morrison and the alcoholism and just in his whole persona and just how it ended up and just what a sad figure he was. So I was kind of intrigued by that, uh, especially since my dad's not really a music guy. And I'm like, dad went to go see a movie, movie about a rock. <laughs> like, what's this about? So, my knowledge of the, and John, you'll be surprised about this. I never really listened to Doors albums, pro- proper albums. Ah, it was, okay. I got there, this is very similar to Bowie for me in that I got the double album singles, you know, uh, record. So, and so, yeah, the best of the Doors. So I got that in, probably I was in college or something. And uh, so that's, and I played that a lot. I really liked their, the, those songs, the singles, the best of, quote unquote, the best of the Doors. So, um, so this was new to me. The song, so the songs I knew going into were the songs that were on that. So essentially, you know, Hel- Hello, I Love You, The Unknown Soldier, Spanish Caravan, mm-hmm. and um, Five to One. So for me, this was kind of, you know, half, well, maybe, t- maybe two thirds, a third of this or so was stuff that I knew. And then the rest was stuff that I didn't know. So um, I, I, I'm mixed on this. I wanted, I, I was, I was a little, probably a little disappointed, particularly the first couple times I heard it because I, I, I wanted to like it. I wanted to learn more about them and get more into it. But I just, I, I kind of agree with Josh in with some of the, 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 I don't necessarily mind as much maybe as Josh, you do the, the keyboards, the, you know, all the different sound effects that Manzarek is getting, which is very, that's the door sound along with right. Jim Morrison's, you know, voice. I would agree with that. So, you know, sometimes, and I absolutely agree not to touch the earth might've been my le- one of my least favorite songs in here. It's like an eerie, like whatever the effects that he's doing with the keyboard, it's not just the keyboards. It's some sort of effect that makes you feel like you're going through like a haunted house or something like that. It's like a weird Halloween kind of spooky sound. That's just mm-hmm. kind of annoying really. So I would agree if that was the, if, if that was the snippet of that 17 minute long song, I am in the camp of, I'm glad that that is not on this album at 17 minutes um incidentally john which do you know which songs on this record were supposed to be the first side were there any like like and what's like the the cutting uh, no off of? i i don't there were only two singles okay. unknown soldier and hello i love you that was the only two singles okay. from it all right so uh, you know but i think i i like morrison's voice when he is belting it out right when he's kind of screaming he's getting passionate i love i think five to one on this is easily for me the best song in the record um yeah. it's it's just powerful wow. I, I like to keep that is fascinating yeah no i love i would say it's my least favorite song on the entire oh, album. god no i no. Yep. Uh, and i you know and, and and we can talk about lyrics and stuff but this is where being you know not really all that caring much about lyrics helps me because i'm sure that there's lyrics on here that are that you can be very critical of and i'm sure people love them I I know that he's a very polarizing figure in that regard, but the musically, oh my God, no, he's, you know, the guitar playing comes alive. Right. Um, and, and Morrison's voice is he's, he's, he's passionate. He's feeling it. I, that's where I like his voice as opposed to something like, yes, the river knows, or maybe summer's almost gone, which are kind of like meandering slogging songs. And his voice is just like, he's, he sounds bored. Right. He's summer's almost gone. It's just, <laughs> it's not, it doesn't do much to, to, to get me into it at all. It's, it's very off putting. So I don't like that Morrison and some of these songs he mixes, both of them in and sometimes he does do that slogging kind of meandering vocals but at least there's something with the music that's kept that's that's keeping me interested but um yeah i don't I, I like it when he's screaming you know um but i think that the i think the book ends i think the opening track hello i love you and then five to one are for me were the best songs on the album so um I think the more I listened to it, I got, I, 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 you know, I, I think like something like love street. Um, I, I appreciated more the more I listened to it. I definitely, I think the song I liked the most of this that I didn't know coming into it was my wild love. That was another one of those. It's almost like a prison gang, you know, song with the hand claps and the, uh, yeah, kind of the really chanting. Like and mm-hmm. there's some weird effect in there. The, like the whoosh, whoosh in the middle of the thing. I don't know what, what yeah. instrument they're using there, but I did like that a lot. Um, so, uh, so yeah, a little mixed, a little disappointed. Um, and maybe, maybe I'll find more to uh, get into with uh, their other albums that we'll be covering. I, I, it's fascinating. I, and I don't mean this to sound condescending. I disagree with everything you guys said. The songs <laughs> that you guys like are the songs I dislike. The songs that you guys don't like are the songs Gosh. that I do like. 
So explain it's yourself, life, Walt. Not not to touch the earth is really interesting to me. Um, Love Street is a song that I think take, I, and it's probably important for me to kind of explain like my love hate relationship with the Doors. Okay, and so that kind of maybe can explain it. To me, Robbie Krieger's a very underrated guitar player. So I'll say that I I don't notice guitar lines very often. But I think because the organ is the number one thing I notice with the Doors, the interplay between Robbie Krieger, who plays the guitar, and uh, Raymond Zarek, who plays the organs and the harpsichord and piano and stuff like that, I always just felt those two were on symbiotic relationship on the same wavelength. And I always notice it. And this album, especially, and here's where having listened to all the Doors albums, I think it might be instructive later when you guys listen, I'll be interested to hear what your take is. But after hearing the first two, this is the best music, musical Doors album. And there's a lot going on. I think in some ways the reason is because a little bit of the context of this album is they basically you know, blew all their songs from their live set in the first two albums because they came out back to back, right? Mm -hmm. So the only one that was left over was Hello, I Love You, which is a song I, I feel I hate because it's it's basically it's like all the indul it's it's not even so much that it's indulgent and it's it's an exact it's so much like all day and all the night by the kinks that they actually even lost a lawsuit that the kinks didn't even want to bring that's how much it is all day and all the night <laughs> it's the same song and it's like a, and, and it's it's so and I'm not alone because Jim Morrison hated that song so much that he sometimes just had Raymond Zarek sing it so I think it was kind of one of those songs that was a really early songwriting attempt. Like they clearly were influenced by the kinks, which is awesome. I don't think they ripped them off, but it's like, it's, it's just kind of one of those songs that it's like, ugh, it's like just overindulgent and just overplayed and all the stuff that I don't like about the doors um, when they're bad. I, do, uh, I agree with Matt that I like Morrison when he's belting stuff, but he, he doesn't belt very often if you know the Doors albums. He more often than not is, uh, at his worst, he's sort of monotone and just, you know, sort of reading. And, and that's in the, at points of this album, a couple songs bleed together. Um, for me, it's a lot of the songs that you guys like, where it's a five to one, I mean, as I'm listening to it, I'm like, boy, Jim Morrison sounds hammered here. And sure enough, you read about it and he's hammered the entire, like basically he's, they go in and they tie it, tie it off literally him and the song to add to it. I would almost definitely guess that songs eight through 11 were the add on songs, because to me, that's when the album started hemorrhaging water. Um, Spanish caravan is saved by the flamenco guitar. Um, I, I think the Unknown Soldier is one of the more overrated door songs, but I the stretch from two to five is what saves it for me because Love Street, Not to Touch the Earth, Summer's Almost Gone, Wintertime Love, Morrison's voice fits a lot better on those. The the ridiculous poetry that is Jim Morrison's lyrics sometimes is toned down a little bit. Um, and those songs for me work the best. Uh, my take on Morrison is his lyrics are ridiculous as a singer, he has an incredible clear voice, which you rarely ever hear. Like he can somehow enunciate, but also have a lot of emotion in it, but he tends to play sort of the same feel to his voice too often for me. But here's where I do turn for Jim Morrison. I'm a big fan of like rock star as frontman, and freaking Jim Morrison's an incredible front man. If you're going for like an aesthetic of a band, I mean, he top 10 front man. And to me, that means a lot because if your front man's a star, then your band is a star. And that's where I love Morrison, like the, you know, the, the rock star. But as a singer, sometimes his stuff bleeds together for me. So I would say I am a slight lean up in this song, but almost entirely because it's one of the best Doors albums musically. And I listen to this album much more musically than I did lyrically, which is kind of funny because I know some people you know, listen to the doors almost exclusively lyrically for Morrison. Uh, I can, I'm, I could post ridiculous lyrics. I, I have to do one. <laughs> like I was trying to figure out what can I do to show like my, my, yeah. the Jim Morrison lyrics and how I laugh at them. So I'm going to um, right here, go to my wild love, which if, if not my least favorite song on is my second least favorite song, but uh, 
the third stanza, and it's two stanzas because four, uh, eight lines here. So two, four, four uh, line stanzas. We get, she rode on to Christmas, she rode to the farm, she rode to Japan, and we entered a town. By this time, the river had changed one degree. She asked for the people to let her go free. So there you go. If you, if you like lyrics like that, you know, five word lyrics, they kind of rhyme in the way that when you write a poem in, you know, fifth grade, they rhyme and they don't really say anything, but they add just enough space that if your lead singer is charismatic, it can have meaning, then all for you. But that to me is indicative of what you get with the doors right there so end of end of take right there i know that was the hottest of hot takes i might have ever so those songs that you don't like is it more for the lyrics or you just like you know what i mean because i i I, it isn't it's it's how everything to me door songs are always how does jim morrison's voice interact with the band because i normally like what the band is playing and then the question becomes does Jim Morrison's voice and aesthetic add to the song or does Jim Morrison's voice and aesthetic drag the song down into sort of like almost a more monotone feel than it should be. And Mm -hmm. I don't know how to explain it other than like when I listen to a song, the music either pops and I can kind of put Morrison in the context or it doesn't. And and like Josh said, like I I think a lot of the, the songs I dislike by The Doors are their most well-known songs. And I actually like a lot of their deeper cuts that are more musical, way better than I like, um, you know, their big hits. Hmm. Well, when you read the lyrics like that, it it sounds like garbage. And now you have to sing it like Jim Morrison. Yeah, it's like, you know, (laughs) my love wild is crazy. She screams like a bird. She moans like a cat when she wants to be heard. You know, like, it's just it's even that, like, aesthetic. And then it's like, at the end, there's just that slight thing, like, rock, come on. You know, like, it's like you hear, like, all the time. And after a while, it's sort of like, yeah, I, I, here's how I describe it. Like, I feel like like a guy like Mick Jagger has more tricks in the rock star book than like a Jim Morrison. Well, did. a lot of Jim them Morrison's do. a star, but yeah. But that's but going back to what you're saying, like where you're you're appreciating his rock stardom quality, right? I sure do. You know, yep. but and and that's that's all well and good, but man, if your music's not there. Like that's it's like so what you know what I mean? Like, uh, so, no, I just but see to me. I mean, why like, am I we listening? Live in a, well, you see, there's there's like you're listening, but then like we see we live in a starless era right now and not to get on my old man like lawn <laughs> thing, but but we don't. We I mean, the closest thing we have to stars comes from the world of hip hop these days. Right. But like we we live in uh, uh, even our pop stars. Right. Are kind of starless to some degree. I'm, I'm trying to think like who 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 has like the ethos that like a Mick Jagger or a Jim Morrison had like no one. You know what I mean? And it's, some of it is because you know, the, the lifestyles were decadent, right? And so a lot of people are not, you know, dying at 27, you know, like they used to, you know, now they're, you know, raising families and releasing singer songwriter albums in their thirties and forties and having kids, you know, they're not doing the, you know, James Dean live fast, die young. There's still a little bit of an ethos of that in hip hop. You know, the part of me that wants people to live healthy and not be, you know, ravaged Rex really embraces that. But let's be honest, part of what makes rock dangerous is the same thing that makes shooting stars, shooting stars. Yeah. Right? And, I, yeah. I, go ahead, Josh. I was going to say, I don't think we can uh, discount kind of the sex appeal of Jim Morrison also. I think yep, that's a big absolutely. draw to the band. Um, and probably why, you know, there's posters of Jim Morrison shirtless and, and that, oh, yeah. rock, and like you said, that rock star, rock star attitude. Can I, to, to add to that real quick, and this might even be a great um, like postscript for this. I, in a, the Rolling Stone music guide that they did later, they described the doors, the first paragraph. And, you know, I'll kind of get into like their renaissances later and their early years in other reviews because we're getting on in time. And I don't want to go too far, but here's how they described it, Josh. And you tell me what you think of this. Okay. The doors ultimately as a band were Jim Morrison. He was dangerous, raw, beautiful, half erect at all times in skin tight leather pants and fatefully self-destructive. By the end of his life, he became tragic and pathetic. It was no wonder that he cited the French symbolists, especially Rimbaud and Baudelaire as inspiration. At their best, his suggestive lyrics were clipped and cinematic, either bursts of street talk or snatches at myth. Calling himself an erotic politician, Morrison was preoccupied with urge, rebellion and release. 
If some of his work now sounds melodramatic or forced, his intensity does still stand out as remaining compelling, and his acknowledgement of night, pain, and loneliness comes off as riveting and real, even if the rest does not age well. I mean, is there a better description of the doors than that? Like, there you go. Yeah, but to I, me, that was I like, think boom. no, and I, I I would agree with all that. And he's certainly genuine, right? There's no, he's not phoning anything in. This is this is who he was, right? And so, for if you want to mock him for ridiculous lyrics or just kind of you know uh, a ridiculous persona, it, it that's who he was. So I'm not gonna say that you know anything bad about that. I don't know. At the, at the end of the day, there's so much music out there, and there's plenty of other you know lead singers or, or frontmen of bands that have that but also have better songs to back up that whole thing and if i'm going to put on an album i'm going to want to be listening to it for the music and you know for all that aspect of it not so much about like wow this guy was cool right or this guy was so mysterious it's just that i don't ha i don't have the time for that necessarily so you mean you mean like listening to an album where you're fascinated because the tropicalia movement was fascinating and informed your listening to it <laughs> yeah but i actually like that better i think well also that's not going to get people it, it, the the doors the whole mistake with the doors that I don't get is that they're like the great one of the greatest bands ever and I'm like the music's not quite there with the Oz Uj Mutantes that to me with the intrigue there was the was the music it wasn't the personalities of the but, band but don't you don't you get though that like that what makes the doors the greatest band to some people is all the things Josh mentioned the sex appeal the counterculture the mysteriousness yes. You can't, yeah, you can't yeah, think of the Doors as one of the greatest bands of all time unless you accept that narrative. Correct. And that's, you know, I, so it's impossible to uncouple that from how you feel about the Doors. So if you're right. just listening to the Doors as a musical act, yeah, you'll never well, understand. That's, and that's it. what but I'm you, saying. Yeah. And that's where I'm going with, you know, because that's mainly because I, I think you got to look at the whole package. And there's plenty of Doors stuff that I like. I'm not even I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm sitting here being like slamming the Doors. Ha, <laughs> Get it. Um, uh -huh. But uh, <laughs> but it's. But but it's just there. I they never got to that level. They were a decent band for me that had a, had a lot of good stuff. But I never put them on this you know this pedestal of being this you know um, well, this, let, this amazing band. I get what you're saying, John. I'm just saying like the music's got to be there more for me, right, to be able to put them up on that pedestal for myself. Well, and I and I'll sort of, sort of this will be my last thought for this. But if Elvis was sort of the gateway to like bringing sex to the mainstream, but he he did it in a love me tender way. You know what I mean? Jim Morrison was up there bringing sex in a different way yep. and his was not love me tender his was you know love me in a dangerous way that really intrigues me but also kind of scares me a little bit and like that's the ultimate to me yep. like the swipe now when you listen to the music that's why we talk about the organs and stuff because ultimately when you hear good Doors songs out of context you realize Robbie Krieger is a pretty damn good, you know, guitar player and Raymond Zarek can really do a lot of stuff with the organs. Mm -hmm. But if they were just doing that, they wouldn't be the doors. Like you need to have Jim That's Morrison true. up there. Yes. Basically, yes. basically, you know, pardon my French, but like fucking the audience. Like that's that's what the door, the doors are. Him doing yeah. that and then the stuff behind him, you know? And he was doing it in 1967. So in 66, which is another thing that I think totally loses context. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure there's other bands that were like the that were Doors esque, but they didn't have a Jim Morrison. So uh, no, and he became this figure, and probably his death, you know, you know, like a lot of times it happens with artists, like their death, you know, canonizes them even correct even more so. So um, then, we, then they become mythological. Yeah, right. Way. And 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 this, yeah. I mean, talk. This guy was mythological when he was alive. So you know, it's. I, I just, um, yeah, I see everything that you're saying, John. I just, I, there's probably other places I'm going to go. This album was was okay for me. I didn't like it, or I didn't love it. I didn't hate it. Um, you know, but it's, uh, yeah, it's just kind of. They never. I was never a huge Doors fan. I guess. Yeah. And I wouldn't disagree. I, I, I wouldn't say this is one of my favorite Doors albums. This is definitely one of the ones you can skip. But, you know, it'll be interesting as you listen, because we're going to see the Doors three more times, two times in the 60s and one time in the 70s. And it will be interesting to sort of do a roundup and see if we stay where we are, if, or if we change our mind with context one way or the other. Yeah, that will, that will give us a, you know, a good overview of the Doors with four albums. So I very much look forward to it. And I also.